Welcome to 2023 and the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the first quarter. Lesson 2, titled God's Covenants with Us, is ready for teaching on January 14. Sabbath afternoon, January 7. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that once again your word is there for us to read. Your word is there for us to listen to and enjoy. Your word is there for us to gain knowledge. Your word is there for us to gain an insight into your character. And this week, as we open your word, as we study our lesson, which is titled God's Covenants with Us, we want to explore more the relationship that we have with you and how we can come to you at any time and how your care is there for us. Lord, as we open your word, we pray your Holy Spirit will guide us. Whether we are visually impaired or whether we're blind, whether we have difficulty reading for whatever reason or whether we're just learning English or whether we're listening to this podcast while we're driving or walking or running or working or having daily worship or preparing to teach a Sabbath school lesson, Lord, please be with each of us and with our families wherever we are around the world, on every of the great continents and islands of the world. We pray that your name may be glorified in the reading of this lesson this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And I'd love to hear where you are listening, how you are listening, and why you are listening. Let's begin with our memory text for this week, which is Deuteronomy 28, verses 1 and 2. Now it shall come to pass, if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all his commandments which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you, because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Let's read that again, Deuteronomy 28, verses 1 and 2. Now it shall come to pass, if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all his commandments which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you, because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Amazingly enough, God has made contracts or covenants with us. Most are bilateral, meaning that both parties, God and humans, have a part to perform. An example of a bilateral covenant is, if you will do this, then I will do that, or I will do this if you will do that. A rarer type of covenant is unilateral. I will do this whether you do anything or not. A few of God's covenants with humanity are unilateral. For example, as it says in Matthew 5.45, He makes His Son rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. Following the flood, God promised humanity and every beast of the earth in Genesis 9 that there would never be another flood to cover all the earth, regardless of our actions, as you read in Genesis 9, verses 9 to 16. And as for me, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the cattle, and every beast of the earth with you, and all that go out of the ark, every beast of the earth. Thus I establish my covenant with you. Never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. Never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is a perpetual sign of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I set my rainbow in the cloud, and it shall be for the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. It shall be, when I bring a cloud over the earth, that the rainbow shall be seen in the cloud, and I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you, and every living creature of all flesh. The waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. The rainbow shall be in the cloud, and I will look on it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. 
He also promised, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer and day and night shall not cease, in Genesis 8.22. The seasons will come and go regardless of what we do. This week, we will study some significant bilateral covenants between God and His children. Let's pray that, by God's grace, we will uphold our end of the bargain. Sunday, January 8. The Salvation Covenant The death of Christ on Calvary made salvation possible for every person who has ever lived or who will ever live. Unlike the promise of the seasons, salvation is not unilateral. It is not given to everyone, regardless of what they do. The belief that everyone will be saved is called universalism. Instead, Jesus clearly taught that, though he died for all humanity, many people travel the broad way to destruction and eternal death, as you read in Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. What do the following texts have to say about how people receive the gift of salvation in Jesus? 1 John chapter 5, verse 13 These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. And Matthew 10, verse 22, And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end will be saved. And John 6, 29, Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. And Second Peter chapter 1, verses 10 and 11, Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure, for if you do these things you will never stumble, for so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Paul understood the bilateral nature of the salvation covenant. Knowing that he was soon to be executed, and in spite of the fact that many of his companions had forsaken him, Paul confidently told his dear friend Timothy that he had upheld his end of the bargain. For I am now ready to be offered, he says in Second Timothy 4, 6-8, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Paul says, I am ready because I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Paul, though, was always very clear that salvation is by faith alone, not by the deeds of the law, and so here he is not somehow looking at his works or achievements as earning him merit with God. The crown of righteousness awaiting him is the righteousness of Jesus, which Paul, by faith, has claimed for himself and has held on to until the end of his life. And so to finish the day, though salvation is an unmerited gift, what's the difference between those who accept the gift and those who don't? What does accepting this gift require that we do? Monday, January 9. To hearken diligently. 
The book of Deuteronomy is the printed version of Moses' farewell messages to the second generation of Israelites following the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. These messages were given on the plains of Moab, just east of Jericho. Deuteronomy has been appropriately called the Book of Remembrance. In this book, Moses reviews God's faithful dealings with Israel. He recounts the travels from Mount Sinai to Kadesh Barnea on the edge of the Promised Land, as well as the rebellion and the forty years of wilderness and wandering. He restated the Ten Commandments, the requirements of the tithe, and the central storehouse. But the primary focus of Deuteronomy is the counsel to obey God and receive His blessings. Moses portrays God as one who has the ability and the desire to care for his people. Read Deuteronomy 28 verses 1 to 14. What great blessings are promised the people? But what must they do to receive them? Deuteronomy chapter 28 beginning at verse 1. Now it shall come to pass, if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God, and observe carefully all his commandments which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you, because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Blessed shall you be in the city, and blessed shall you be in the country. Blessed shall be the fruit of your body, the produce of your ground, and the increase of your herds, the increase of your cattle, and the offspring of your flocks. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall you be when you come in, and blessed shall you be when you go out. The Lord will cause your enemies who rise against you to be defeated before your face. They shall come out against you one way and flee before you seven ways. The Lord will command the blessing on you in your storehouses and in all which you set your hand, and he will bless you in the land which the Lord your God is giving you. The Lord will establish you as a holy people to himself, just as he has sworn to do. If you keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in his ways, then all peoples of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of you. And the Lord will grant you plenty of goods in the fruit of your body, in the increase of your livestock, and in the produce of your ground, in the land of which the Lord swore to your fathers to give you. The Lord will open to you his good treasure, the heavens, to give the rain to your land in its season, and to bless all the work of your hand. You shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow." and the Lord will make you the head and not the tail. You shall be above only and not be beneath, if you heed the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today, and are careful to observe them. So you shall not turn aside from any of the words which I command you this day, to the right or the left, to go after other gods to serve them. Moses was very eager for the people to understand that God had wonderful, even miraculous blessings in mind for them. His words, if you shall hearken diligently, let them know that their eternal destiny was at stake here. What a powerful manifestation of the reality of free choice. They were God's chosen nation, recipients of great blessings and great promises, But those blessings and promises were not unconditional. They needed to be accepted, received and acted upon. And nothing God has asked of them was too hard for them to do either. For this commandment which I command you today is not too mysterious for you, nor is it far off. It is not in heaven that you should say, Who will ascend into heaven for us and bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it? Nor is it beyond the sea that you should say, Who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it? But the word is very near you." in your mouth and in your heart, that you may do it. That's Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 11 to 14 
Of course, besides the blessings, there were the warnings of the curses, what would come upon them if they were to disobey, that is, what consequences their sin and rebellion would bring, as you read in Deuteronomy 28, verses 15 to 68. But it shall come to pass, if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all his commandments and his statutes, which I command you today, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. Cursed shall you be in the city, and cursed shall you be in the country. Cursed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Cursed shall be the fruit of your body, and the produce of your land, and the increase of your cattle, and the offspring of your flocks. Cursed shall you be when you come in, and cursed shall you be when you go out. The Lord will send on you cursing, confusion, and rebuke in all that you set your hand to do, until you are destroyed and until you perish quickly because of the wickedness of your doings in which you have forsaken me. The Lord will make the plague cling to you until he has consumed you from the land which you are going to possess. The Lord will strike you with consumption, with fever, with inflammation, with severe burning fever, with the sword, with scorching and with mildew. They shall pursue you until you perish, and your heavens which are over your head shall be bronze, and the earth which is under you shall be iron." The Lord will change the rain of your land to powder and dust. From the heaven it shall come down on you until you are destroyed. The Lord will cause you to be defeated before your enemies. You shall go out one way against them and flee seven ways before them. And you shall become troublesome to all the kingdoms of the earth. Your carcasses shall be food for all the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth, and no one shall frighten them away. The Lord will strike you with the boils of Egypt, with tumours, with the scab, and with the itch, from which you cannot be healed. The Lord will strike you with madness and blindness and confusion of heart, and you shall grope at noonday as a blind man gropes in darkness. You shall not prosper in your ways, you shall be only oppressed and plundered continually, and no one shall save you. You shall betroth the wife, but another man shall lie with her. You shall build a house, but you shall not dwell in it. You shall plant a vineyard, but shall not gather its grapes. Your ox shall be slaughtered before your eyes, but you shall not eat of it. Your donkey shall be violently taken away from before you, and shall not be restored to you. Your sheep shall be given to your enemies, and you shall have no one to rescue them. Your sons and your daughters shall be given to another people, and your eyes shall look and fail with longing for them all day long. And there shall be no strength in your hand." A nation whom you have not known shall eat the fruit of your land and the produce of your labour, and you shall be only oppressed and crushed continually. So you shall be driven mad because of the sight which your eyes see. The Lord will strike you in the knees and on the legs with severe boils which cannot be healed, and from the sole of your foot to the top of your head. The Lord will bring you and the king whom you set over you to a nation which neither of you nor your fathers have known. And there you shall serve other gods, wood and stone, and you shall become an astonishment, a proverb and a byword among all nations where the Lord will drive you. You shall carry much seed out to the field, but gather little in, for the locust shall consume it. You shall plant vineyards and tend them, but You shall neither drink of the wine nor gather the grapes, for the worm shall eat them. You shall have olive trees throughout all your territory, but you shall not anoint yourself with the oil, for your olives shall drop off. You shall beget sons and daughters, but they shall not be yours, for they shall go into captivity. Locusts shall consume all your trees and the produce of your land. The alien who is among you shall rise higher and higher above you, and you shall come down lower and lower. He shall lend to you, but you shall not lend to him. He shall be the head, and you shall be the tail."
Moreover, all these curses shall come upon you and pursue and overtake you until you are destroyed, because you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes which he commanded you. And they shall be upon you for a sign and a wonder, and on your descendants forever, because you did not serve the Lord your God with joy and gladness of heart. For the abundance of everything, therefore, you shall serve your enemies, whom the Lord will send against you, in hunger, in thirst, in nakedness, and in need of everything. And he will put a yoke of iron on your neck until he has destroyed you. The Lord will bring a nation against you from afar, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flies, a nation whose language you will not understand, a nation of fierce countenance, which does not respect the elderly, nor show favour to the young. And they shall eat the increase of your livestock and the produce of your land until you are destroyed. They shall not leave you grain or new wine or oil or the increase of your cattle or the offspring of your flocks until they have destroyed you. They shall besiege you at all your gates until your high and fortified walls, in which you trust, come down throughout all your land, and they shall besiege you at all your gates throughout all your land which the Lord your God has given you. You shall eat the fruit of your own body, the flesh of your own sons and your daughters, whom the Lord your God has given you, in the siege and desperate straits in which your enemy shall distress you. The sensitive and very refined man among you will be hostile toward his brother, toward the wife of his bosom, and toward the rest of his children whom he leaves behind, so that he will not give any of them the flesh of his children whom he will eat, because he has nothing left in the siege and desperate straits in which your enemy shall distress you at all your gates." The tender and delicate woman among you, who would not venture to set the sole of her foot on the ground because of her delicateness and sensitivity, will refuse to the husband of her bosom and to her son and her daughter her placenta, which comes out from between her feet and her children whom she bears, for she will eat them secretly for lack of everything in the siege and desperate straits in which your enemy shall distress you at all your gates. If you do not carefully observe all the words of the law that are written in this book, for you may fear this glorious and awesome name, the Lord your God, then the Lord will bring upon you and your descendants extraordinary plagues, great and prolonged plagues, and serious and prolonged illnesses. Moreover, he will bring back on you all the diseases of Egypt of which you were afraid, and they shall cling to you. Also, every sickness and every plague which is not written in this book of the law will the Lord bring upon you until you are destroyed." You shall be left few in number, whereas you were as the stars of heaven in multitude, because you would not obey the voice of the Lord your God. And it shall be that, just as the Lord rejoiced over you, to do you good and multiply you, so the Lord will rejoice over you to destroy you and bring you to nothing, and you shall be plucked from off the land which you go to possess." Then the Lord will scatter you among all peoples, from one end of the earth to the other. And there you shall serve other gods, which neither you nor your fathers have known, wood and stone. And among those nations you shall find no rest, nor shall the sole of your foot have a resting place. But there the Lord will give you a trembling heart, failing eyes and anguish of soul. Your life shall hang in doubt before you. You shall fear day and night and have no assurance of life. In the morning you shall say, Oh, that it were evening, and at evening you shall say, Oh, that it were morning, because of the fear which terrifies your heart, and because of the sight which your eyes see. And the Lord will take you back to Egypt in ships, by the way of which I said to you, You shall never see it again. And there you shall be offered for sale to your enemies as male and female slaves. But no one will buy you. And so to finish today, what does it mean for us today to hearken diligently to what God tells us to do?
Tuesday, January 10. Honour the Lord. The book of Proverbs is not so much about right and wrong as it is about wisdom and foolishness. As one reads through the book, one will see the benefits of wisdom and the pitfalls of foolishness. Read Proverbs chapter 3, verses 1 to 10. What wonderful promises are given here? Also, what does first fruits of all your increase mean? Proverbs 3, beginning at verse 1. My son, do not forget my law, but let your heart keep my commands. For length of days and long life and peace they will add to you. Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. And so find favour and high esteem in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. Honour the Lord with your possessions and with the firstfruits of all your increase. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. God asks us to put him first in the management of our possessions as an acknowledgement of his ownership of all things and as a demonstration of our faith in him to provide for us. But even more than this, he says that if we will put him first, then he will bless what's left. For us to do this, that is, to put him first, is an act of faith an act of trust, a manifestation of trusting in the Lord with all your heart and indeed not leaning on your own understanding, which is especially important because so often things happen that we cannot understand and cannot make sense of. Nothing, though, should spur us on more in trusting God and his love than does the cross. When you realise what each one of us has been given in Jesus, not just as our Creator and our Sustainer, but also as our Redeemer, returning to God the firstfruits of whatever we have is indeed the least we could do. Jesus as our Creator, we look at John chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of of men, and our sustainer, Hebrews 1 verse 3, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, and as our Redeemer, Revelation chapter 5 verse 9, and they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and have redeemed us to God by your blood, out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Ellen White writes in Councils on Stewardship, page 81, Not only does the Lord claim the tithe as his own, but he tells us how it should be reserved for him. He says, Honour the Lord with your substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. This does not teach that we are to spend our means on ourselves and bring to the Lord the remnant, even though it should be otherwise an honest tithe. Let God's portion be first set apart. End of quote. God says that if we put him first, our barns will be filled with plenty in Proverbs 3 verse 10. Yet this is not going to happen by miracle. That is, you are not going to wake up one day and find your barns and vats suddenly full. Instead, the Bible is filled with principles about good stewardship, careful planning and financial responsibility, of which faithfulness to what God calls us to do is our first and foremost responsibility. And so, to finish today, 
How, though, do we learn to trust God and in His promises during hard financial times when even while we are seeking to be faithful, the barns and vats are not full? Wednesday, January 11, The Tithe Contract There is a close spiritual connection between the practice of tithing and our relationship to God. The Israelites prospered when they obeyed God and were faithful in tithing. In contrast, they fell on hard times when they didn't. They seemed to follow a cycle of obedience and prosperity, and then disobedience and problems. It was during one of these periods of unfaithfulness that God, through the prophet Malachi, proposed a bilateral contract with his people. Read Malachi 3, 7-11. What are the promises and the obligations found in these verses? Malachi 3, beginning at verse 7. Yet from the days of your fathers you have gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you said, In what way shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, In what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven, and pour out for you such blessing, that there will not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. God promised the people that if they would return to him, he would return to them. When they asked what he meant by returning to him, he explicitly said, Stop robbing me of tithe and offering. Their robbery was the reason they were being cursed. Here is God's solution to the problem of the curse. Bring all the tithes, the whole tithe, into the storehouse, Malachi 3.10. And if you do this, then I will open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. If we don't have room enough to receive it, we have a surplus with which we can help others and help to advance the cause of God. And then from Councils on Stewardship, page 75, we read, He who gave his only begotten Son to die for you has made a covenant with you. He gives you his blessings, and in return he requires you to bring him your tithes and offerings. No one will ever dare to say that there was no way in which he could understand in regard to this matter. God's plan regarding tithes and offerings is definitely stated in the third chapter of Malachi. God calls upon his human agents to be true to the contract he has made with them. End of quote. One of the positive cycles of obedience is recorded during the reign of good King Hezekiah of Judah. There was a genuine revival in Judah, and the people started faithfully returning their tithes and offerings to the temple storehouse. So much came in that it was piled in heaps at the temple. Second Chronicles 35.1 tells what happened when the people brought in abundance the first fruits of grain and wine, oil and honey, and of all the produce of the field, and they brought in abundantly the tithe of everything. And so to finish the day, what does your tithing, or lack thereof, say about your own spirituality and relationship to God? Thursday, July 12. Seek ye first. 
It was said of Jesus that the common people heard him gladly in Mark 12:37. Let's read that. Therefore David himself calls him Lord. How is he then his son? And the common people heard him gladly. Most of the people in the large crowds who followed and listened to Jesus were members of this class, the common people. They were the ones who were fed on the mountainside and who heard this Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said to them basically, I know you are concerned about providing for your families. You worry about food and drink that you will need daily and the clothing that you need for warmth and protection. But here is what I propose. Read Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 to 33. What was promised here, and what were the people to do in order to receive those promises? Matthew 6, beginning at verse 25. Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. For they neither sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? So, why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon, in all his glory, was not arrayed like one of these." Now, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? Or, What shall we drink? Or, What shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Many of the promises of God have elements of bilateral covenant. That is, in order to receive the blessing, we need to do our part as well. Read Isaiah 26 verse 3. What are we asked to do in order to have the peace of God? Isaiah 26, verse 3, You will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you, because he trusts in you. Read 1 John 1, 9, What will Jesus do if we confess our sins? 1 John 1, 9, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And read Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. What are the ifs and thens of God's proposal here? Second Chronicles 7, verse 14. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. All these verses, and many others, deal with the important fact that although God is sovereign, although God is our creator and sustainer, and although salvation is a gift of grace and unmerited on our part, we still have a part to play in the great controversy drama here on earth. Using the sacred gift of free will, free choice, we must choose to follow the prompting of the Holy Spirit and obey what God calls us to do. Though God offers us blessings and life, we can choose cursing and death instead. No wonder God says in Deuteronomy 30 verse 19, Therefore choose life, that both you and your descendants may live. Friday, January 13. From Testimonies for the Church, Volume 3, page 395, we read, Whenever God's people, in any period of the world, 
have cheerfully and willingly carried out his plan in systematic benevolence, tithing, and in gifts and offerings, they have realised the standing promise that prosperity should attend all their labours just in proportion as they obeyed his requirements. When they acknowledged the claims of God and complied with his requirements, honouring him with their substance, their barns were filled with plenty. But, when they robbed God in tithes and in offerings, they were made to realise that they were not only robbing Him, but themselves, for He limited His blessings to them just in proportion as they limited their offerings to Him. End of quote. The Bible is very clear that we are saved through faith alone, a gift of God's grace. Our obedience to God's commands is a response to God's grace. It doesn't earn it, after all, If it were earned, it wouldn't be grace. See Romans chapter 4, verses 1 to 4. What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. Indeed, when we look at God's bilateral covenant with us, we can see both our blessings and our responsibilities. By our responses to what God offers to us, we establish our relationship with Him and, to a great degree, determine our own destiny. Obedience, the service and allegiance of love, is the true sign of discipleship. Instead of releasing us from obedience, it is faith and faith only that makes us partakers of the grace of Christ, which enables us to render the obedience that God asks from us. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. 1. It has been said that if every Adventist were faithful in returning tithe, our church would have more than enough money to do all that it needs to do for spreading the message. What are you doing in terms of tithes and offerings to help the church do what it has been called to do? Two, dwell more on the idea of how important our choices and our works are in our relationship with God. How do we keep the questions of works and obedience, including tithe paying and good stewardship, before us, but without falling into the trap of legalism? And three, In class, talk about the question at the end of Tuesday's study regarding when hard times come, even when we have been faithful. How do we understand that if this happens, and how do we keep from being discouraged when it does? And now it's time for our mission story for this week, read by my niece Sibylla, who, like me, is also a volunteer. Thank you, Sibylla. Making a Deal with God by Andrew McChesney Dmitry Begal, a student from Russia, ran out of money several months after enrolling in the Masters in Theology program at Friedensau Adventist University in Germany. His options seemed limited. He could work on campus or in a nearby retirement home but the income would only partially cover his tuition. As a foreigner, he could not take out a state loan like the German students, but he could apply for a scholarship, which was smaller than the loan but did not require repayment. As Dimitri prayed over the dilemma, he felt impressed to make a deal with God. Lord, he said, if you bless me with this scholarship, I promise to set aside a second tithe to support mission work. Dimitri applied for the scholarship and, to his joy, it was approved. He began setting aside a second 10% of his gross income for mission work. As the semesters rolled by, he was approved for the scholarship again and again, and he kept giving a second tithe to mission work. Despite the second tithe, he still somehow always had enough money to cover tuition and other expenses. He even was able to set aside money for an emergency. Then Dimitri's five-year-old laptop began to act up 
as he worked on his master's thesis. Twice he had to buy spare parts to self-repair it. One day, he found that he could no longer close the laptop screen. The hinges refused to budge. A new laptop was needed if he hoped to finish his thesis, and he was glad to have the small emergency fund. But as he prayed about the situation, he remembered a friend, also from the former Soviet Union, who was serving with his family of five as missionaries in the South American jungle. High humidity had ruined his friend's tablet, and a robust device was desperately needed to continue his work. Dimitri couldn't understand why he was thinking about his friend in South America when he was the one in need of a laptop to graduate. But he bought a waterproof, dustproof laptop and mailed it to his friend. Shortly after sending the package, an online advertisement popped up on Dimitri's laptop screen that offered the very hinges that he needed for the laptop. He ordered the hinges and after installing them, the screen opened and closed like a new one. Amazingly, the laptop still works today, eight years later. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. Sponsored by the Sabbath School Department and distributed through Hope Channel Australia, this podcast is also redistributed by Hope Channel Germany, Christian Record Services for the Blind. It is also available on SoundCloud and through multiple podcast distributors, including Apple iTunes. And you can listen and watch at the same time on YouTube. Remember, God is always faithful. And here is a disclaimer. Contents of these lessons are not intended to be financial advice, but is general commentary based on biblical principles. The reader is encouraged to seek competent professional advice which will suit their particular personal situation.